Hello everybody, today we are going to be talking about the devil's temptation of Jesus as adapted into the story of Paradise Regained. Paradise Regained is John Milton's sequel to his much more famous work, Paradise Lost. I've already covered Paradise Lost on the channel, so if you want to check that out, a link to the video will be in the description, but you can understand this story without having to know that one, as both are adapted directly from the Bible. In the Bible, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. At the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, he went into the wilderness where the devil tempted him for 40 days. This story immediately follows Jesus' baptism, and to many is the beginning of his earthly ministry. So John Milton took that story as the beginning of humanity's redemption and paired it as the natural sequel and conclusion to the narrative he opened in Paradise Lost, which was the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. So the primary crux of this story is how the devil decides to tempt Jesus and the conversations between the two. As a biblical nerd, I find this story incredibly fascinating and hopefully I'm able to convey that at least a little bit. Even if you have no interest in the Bible or any other aspect of Christianity, just hearing the argument that the devil gives to Jesus of why he should quit and Jesus' counter-argument against him are fantastic in their own right. If you are familiar with Paradise Lost, or at least my video on it, then the devil that is portrayed in this story is the same characterization that Milton had in Paradise Lost. So, while it's all based on biblical events, it's also interesting to see a kind of conclusion for that character. This story also gives me an excuse to talk about a bunch of obscure theories when it comes to religious prophecy and demonology, so of course I'm going to talk about it. So if that sounds interesting to you, then stick around as we talk about the argument between Jesus Christ and the devil as portrayed in Paradise Regained, which will inevitably lead to me ranting and raving about angels and demons and other forbidden knowledge of Christianity's lore, but I think that's what you all are here for at this point. But before you guys have to hear me ramble about obscure religious literature, let's talk about something that actually matters, like managing your money. Because as someone who's currently trying to budget for a house, a wedding, and business investments, I get that it can be stressful. But now, Neither of us have to stress any more thanks to today's sponsor, Rocket Money. Rocket Money is the all-in-one finance platform that helps you save more and spend less. This personal finance app allows you to manage subscriptions, lower your bills, build a custom budget, and grow your savings all in one place. Right now, I've got a lot of irons in the fire, and the last thing I need is subscriptions that I forgot about and hidden recurring fees creeping up on me and keeping me from buying things that I need to buy now. Rocket Money allows you to set budgets and then get notifications about your current spending. Rocket Money also keeps track of all of your recurring subscriptions and allows you to cancel any of them in one easy step. The app also keeps track of your investments and gives you a clear picture of your net worth as well as set up a smart savings account in-app that you can withdraw from at any time. You can even use Rocket Money to negotiate your bills and monitor your credit. Rocket Money doesn't just provide you with up-to-date information on your finances, but it also gives you support and insight on how to improve your financial lifestyle. So if you're someone who's looking to get smart about their money, which is hopefully all of us, then right now is the perfect time to do it because if you go to rocketmoney.com forward slash windigoon or go to the link in the description, you will be able to get Rocket Money for free. From there, you can get premium to unlock even more features in the app and join the 3.4 million users who use Rocket Money today. Again, that's rocketmoney.com forward slash windigoon or go to the link in the description to get in for free now. Get your money right in 2023. Thank you all so much for watching the ad. Thank you so much to Rocket Money for sponsoring this video. It really does mean the most. Hope you all check them out. Link is in the description and we are back to the video. We are gonna go ahead and get into it, but as always, thank you for watching. Now something to get out of the way as we start this story is that the story of Jesus's temptation in the wilderness is slightly different depending on which of the three gospel accounts you look at. While John doesn't mention it, the other gospels say that following Jesus's baptism, Jesus went out into the wilderness where he fasted for 40 days and then was given three different temptations by the devil. Well, 
at least Matthew and Luke say that, Mark literally only has two verses that talk about it. Like legit, if you just read Mark, the entire story is summarized as, And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered unto him. That's it. That's one of the reasons that reading the Gospels is so interesting, because one of them will mention things briefly, where another one expands upon it and gives us more insight to the life of Christ. But it's, it's still funny to just read Mark, and Mark's like, yeah, and then like, you know, Jesus went into the woods and fought the devil for a while. Anyway, like, I guess he didn't think it was that important. But the accounts of Matthew and Luke go into greater detail. The only discrepancy between the two is the order that the temptations came in. Milton goes with the account from Luke because the ending at the temple is much more dramatic. So Milton takes the narrative that is portrayed in Matthew and Luke and then expands on it, filling in the gaps of what the conversation might have been or what the temptations might have looked like that aren't expanded on in the Gospels themselves. So in other words, while he is going off of what's in the Bible, he has a lot of room to work with. And don't worry, Milton is just as dramatic and over the top here as he was in Paradise Lost. So without further ado, let's get into the story. Similar to Paradise Lost and most of the Greek epics, Milton opens the story with the call on a muse. I've talked about it before, but in a lot of older poetry, the author would open by calling on one of the muses from Greek mythology to help them portray what they were trying to explain with words on the page. However, Milton being a preacher and the basis of this story being Christian, instead of calling on a muse, he calls on the Holy Spirit and the angels. So the opening of Paradise Regained and Paradise Lost can be seen as a sort of prayer for wisdom as he writes this tale. The story opening with the lines, I who erewhile the happy garden sung by one man's disobedience lost, now sing recovered paradise to all mankind by one man's firm obedience fully tried through all temptation and the tempter foiled in all his wiles, defeated and repulsed and Eden raised in the waste wilderness. In other words, while he once spoke about how the garden was lost by man's disobedience, he will now speak of how the garden was regained in the wilderness by one man's firm obedience. The story opens with the baptism of Jesus Christ. Whenever Jesus began his earthly ministry, the first thing that he did was go to his cousin John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Christ, and John the Baptist baptized Jesus. This was seen as the firm beginning of his ministry on earth. It says in the Bible that whenever Jesus was raised up out of the water, that the Holy Spirit came down to him in the form of a dove, and God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now all of that is from the biblical account. Here we have Milton's first addition to the story. As this is happening, Milton says that Satan is watching all of this. And that as soon as the Holy Spirit comes down and God says that he is pleased with Jesus, Satan begins to worry. See, it's revealed later in the story that Satan knew that Jesus was to be the Son of God as he had heard the tale of Nazareth when the angels appeared and said that the Son of God is born and that he's been watching Jesus for all of these years to see if he would try any form of conquest or to figure out what God's plan was. And while he was unsure of Jesus's power, seeing God himself send down a bird and then God say that he is happy with his son causes Satan to realize this guy's probably the real deal. So on hearing this, Satan gathers together all of his demons or fallen angels to discuss their next move. It's mentioned that between Paradise Lost and now, the demons had made their way out of hell and can freely move between hell and earth. Because if you'll remember, one of the main points in Paradise Lost was that humanity freely accepted the devil and sin and death into the world. So now the demons have reigned back and forward. Their power is kept in check by God. They can't just wantonly kill off humanity, but they can tempt them since humanity can choose to follow them instead of God. So it says here that the demons are gathered together in the air. This could either mean that they are invisible in a different plane of existence on earth with everyone else, or that they are quite literally like up in the sky talking to each other. Cause you know, they got wings and whatnot. Satan says that now, he worries that this Jesus Christ is the real deal and that the long-awaited bruise may be upon them. This is a reference to back in the Garden of Eden whenever God said that one day the Son of Man will come to bruise the serpent's head 
or in other words, God would send his son to destroy the devil forever. Satan quickly brings up the point that they also can't just fight this guy. Because if you'll remember the story in Paradise Lost, the reason they were cast out of heaven in the first place, or fell out of heaven, is because they were trying to declare war against the armies of heaven, and then Jesus showed up, and his power was so immense that they decided to jump into hell rather than fight back. So they can't take this guy head on. So the devil reasons that the best way to take this guy down is the same way he took down the rest of humanity through temptation. And remember, Satan's original problem with Jesus is that he felt betrayed because he wanted to take the place that Jesus had as the son or the right hand of God. So Satan reasons that if this Jesus is where I once was, then I know the thing that would have gotten me then was the opportunity to show my power or wisdom. So if we can do what we did to Adam and Eve and use his pride to get him thinking the way that we do, then we might have a shot at both him and God. I, when no other durst, soul undertook the dismal expedition to find out and ruin Adam, and the exploit performed successfully. A calmer voyage now will waft me, and the way found prosperous once induces best hope of like success. In other words, not only is he going to try the same thing he did with Adam, but this time he thinks it's going to be easier, because he already did it once. God sees all of this in heaven, and this is actually the only time in the story that we are given the perspective of God in heaven. That happened a lot in Paradise Lost, but this is the only time that it happens in Paradise Regained. God sees all of this and tells Gabriel that he knows the devil is now going to try to tempt Jesus, but that it is fitting, because what kind of sacrifice for humanity or representative of humanity would Jesus be if he didn't experience temptation? And while talking to Gabriel, God says he might have learned less overweening since he failed in Job, whose constant perseverance overcame whatever his cruel malice could invent. Job is a famous character from the Old Testament of the Bible. Effectively, the devil told God that he could corrupt any one of God's followers if given a bit of temptation and hardship. So Job was put to the test and suffered and tempted by the devil. And in spite of all of it, Job never turned away from God. So God is saying here that Satan thinks this is going to be just like Adam. He's going to tempt him with pride, and that's all it's going to take. But he hasn't considered that Jesus is more like Job than he is Adam. And that in order for Christ to be a sinless human, he must experience temptation. Because sinlessness without the human experience and human wants is meaningless. And how could he one day take the throne if he didn't deserve it? We then come back to Jesus Christ, who is now walking through the wilderness shortly after his baptism. Jesus Christ is thinking on divinity and his place in this world, and how he feels the Holy Spirit led him to begin walking through the woods. As he is walking, he thinks on how he has always desired to meditate on scripture, and that he knows that if God is leading him to do something now, it must be for a purpose. This gets into a part of the story that was very highly debated back in John Milton's day. And while there's a bit more of a consensus on the topic now, it's still definitely a hot issue. And that is the human divinity of Jesus Christ. He is the son of God, he is a part of God himself, but he was made flesh and dwelt among us as one of us. If Jesus Christ was the only perfect person who ever lived, which most of Christianity agrees with, then what does that even mean? Well, at John Milton's time, this was hotly debated between church leaders, rulers, Protestants, Catholics, and everyone else. Some believed that to be fully God, Jesus had to be omniscient and omnipotent. In other words, he knew everything all at once and was also all powerful over everything all at once. But that would mean that whenever Jesus was on earth as a human, that he had full knowledge and power over the future time existence and everything else. But several argued that that would mean any temptation or trial that he went through would be null and void. Because if you can see and control the future, then choices are really meaningless. On the other end of the spectrum, people argued the human side of it, saying that Jesus was a perfectly normal person who just at certain times was given visions or knowledge of what he was to do next, but for every other respect, he was just a normal guy. 
There's even an idea called the baptismal revelation that up until Jesus's baptism, he was just a normal guy who had no knowledge that he was the son of God or that he was to be the sacrifice for humanity until the moment of his baptism. And whenever that dove came down that I mentioned earlier, some people believe that whenever the Holy Spirit came to him in the form of a dove, that is the moment that he received knowledge of the world and existence and his role as the son of God. So there were a bunch of ideas floating around at the time Milton wrote Paradise Regained. However, Milton's idea, or I mean, he never explicitly says it. There's never like a parenthesis where he describes his feelings on theology or whatever. But the Jesus that he portrays in the story seems to be in line with most modern interpretations of what the divine Christ really means. And while I can't profess to be fully knowledgeable on every different sect of Christianity and every different theory for what God is, I have sat under a lot of different religious leaders and churches in my time, and I have never heard any, to my knowledge, I've never heard any that have said something other than the theory I'm about to say, which is also the Jesus portrayed in Paradise Regained. The general consensus is that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. In other words, he had the mind and wisdom of God as it applies to humanity. In other words, all of his knowledge was perfect. All of his wisdom was perfect. His guidance, uh, his leadership was all perfect. But that perfection was limited to the human form. In other words, he still felt emotion like love and sadness and feelings like pain and hunger. His experience on earth was not exempt from the conditions of humanity. The mind of Christ was perfect in every way we can imagine, but he was still human during his time on earth. That explains how the same Jesus who sang songs and laughed with his disciples was the same Jesus who cried at hearing that Lot had died. It explains how the same Jesus who was furious when he saw that God's temple was overran with markets and merchants is the same Jesus who was afraid in the garden of Gethsemane and told God that if there be any other way, to not let him go through the crucifixion. And it explains that while he was sinless, which is very important for, you know, the whole dying for humanity thing, he also experienced the downsides of humanity, like temptation. Because as God in the story said earlier, what kind of representative of humanity would he be if he didn't go through the same trials that they do? That's a lot of setup, and sorry if that was boring, but it's important for whenever we see how Jesus reacts to Satan in the story, that we understand Milton is coming from the perspective that Christ fully understands his place as Jesus on earth, and that he fully understands his divinity and is divine in his wisdom and words. However, he can experience temptation and is refuting these not just for the sake of you know, making the devil feel sad, but because he is actually refuting the temptation he's experiencing in that moment. In other words, it makes the experience real rather than just a show of force. Also, whenever I sit down to make these videos, I try to, you know, pick fun, easy topics, and then I just spent like 10 minutes explaining the divinity of Jesus Christ. So I'm sure the comments are gonna be thrilled with that. So as Jesus is walking through the wilderness, he's thinking on these things and mentions that he feels hungry. Again, he's been walking for nearly 40 days at this point. As he's walking, an old man walks out of the wood line. It seems that the old man is gathering together firewood and he asks Jesus what he's doing all the way out here. Jesus just says that he's walking through the wilderness and then the old man says, aren't you the guy who was baptized by John the Baptist some few days ago? The old man continues and says, well, you're clearly hungry and I'm clearly hungry. And during that whole charade, I heard both of you say that you were the son of God. So if you really are the son of God, why don't you take all of these useless rocks around here and make them into bread? Then we can both be happy. And then Jesus replies, thinkest thou such force in bread? Is it not written for I discern thee other than thou seemst? Man lives not by bread only, but each word proceeding from the mouth of God, who fed our fathers here with manna. In the mount, Moses was 40 days, nor eat nor drank. And 40 days, Elijah, without food, wandered this barren waste. The same I now. Why dost thou then suggest to me distrust knowing who I am, as I know who thou art? 
the parentheses about I discern thee not what thou seemest, and him at the end saying I know what you are, this old man is Satan in disguise. Spoilers. And Jesus replies to him and says, Elijah, the prophet, had to suffer without food. Moses had to suffer without food. So who would I be to not share that same burden that they bared in my name? So this temptation doesn't work. And it says that Satan does this grand transformation and turns back to his true form. Also, to give you an idea of how much, you know, Milton's spicing up the story, the entire account of that first temptation in the book of Luke just says, and the devil said unto him, it's never mentioned that he's in disguise, by the way. It's just, and the devil said unto him, if thou be the son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So Mil Milton's, you know, having fun with it. I could just imagine like he was blind at the time that he wrote this, by the way, Milton. So I could just imagine blind Milton sitting there like, what if... I made the devil an old man. That would be fun. So now Satan, standing before him undisguised, goes on his whole charade of, oh, well, I just came to see you and how wonderful and great you were. And even though I've been cut off from most of my power of God, I can still see divine beauty. And you sure are beautiful. And then he says, well, I've just been playing my part, doing what I'm supposed to. Like that Job guy, for example, whom I mentioned earlier was a person Satan tempted. He says, it was my job and God gave me power whenever I was supposed to tempt Job. But I was just doing that to help humanity out, to, you know, show them a steadfast person to get behind. And also, whenever I went to Ahab, a lot of people think that, you know, I destroyed Ahab, uh, which is a king, a wicked king from the Old Testament. The devil's like, I, a lot of people think I destroyed Ahab, but really, I just did what Ahab asked me to. You know, I just used some of my power to help him out. So really, I, I've been looking out for the little guy this whole time. Satan says, men generally think me much a foe to all mankind. Why should I? They to me never did wrong or violence. By them, I lost not what I lost. Rather, by them, I gained what I have gained. And with them dwell co-partner in these regions of the world. If not dispoor, lend them off my aid, off my advice, by presages and signs and answers, oracles, portents, and dreams, whereby they may direct their future life. Envy, they say, excites me, thus to gain companions of my misery and woe. At first it may be, but long since, with woe near acquainted, now I feel by proof that fellowship in pain divides not smart, nor lightens aught each man's peculiar load. Small consolation, then, where man adjoined, this wounds me most. What can it less? That man, man fallen, shall be restored. I, nevermore. So the devil's saying, why would I have a problem with humanity? All I've ever done is try to help them. And I do help them with dreams, with signs. You know, people call on me, the devil, to give them knowledge of the future. And I do that. I'm just trying to help them out. And he says that one day humanity can be restored. We all know the prophecy that they can join by your side, but I surely can't. So really, I'm just trying to be a help to whoever I can and whoever wants me to. What's also funny, we're, we're about to get into Christ's response, but what's funny is just like with Paradise Lost, a bunch of people read this story of like, oh, is Satan the good guy? Is Satan really the cool dude and God's the bad person? Because uh, people just want to be edgy. And I saw so many, like, analysis of this story that took that section I just read and were like, you know, Satan's right. Like, he, he's got my vote. When I can't stress this enough. That is the devil talking. Of course he is going to be manipulative in what he says. Do, do people, do, side note, do people who go into like Christian stories like this, do they expect that the devil's just going to be like, wow, I can't wait to kill some children. I, I just love eating babies. And whenever they read it and the devil's like, look, I'm trying to help humanity. They're just like, man, I, I never thought of it that way. Jesus responds and effectively says, yeah, why do you think they need you? <laughs> why do you think humanity needs anything? Because the whole sin, death, and uh, not good stuff was your idea. 
Humanity was perfect in the Garden of Eden, and then you came in and ruined that. So the only reason anyone would look to you because they're worried about their future or loved ones or people who have passed on or what have you is because they're looking for answers to stuff you brought into the world. Not only that, but every deal you make is in order to gain more power. If it's not to make humanity turn away from God and see themselves as icons of God and things to be trusted in, so that way they don't go to a divine power that actually means something against you, then it's to directly benefit yourself and make people worship you or think that you should be in charge. He talks about Job and he's like, what reason did you have to torment Job? Like Job and God managed to use the story for good and the reverence of what a follower of God can be. But the reason you did it was just because you didn't like him. <laughs> just because you wanted to torture the guy. He says that you have abused humanity for thousands of years to build up your own pride and power and now have the gall to stand before me and say that you're really just looking out for him. Jesus says that my point and God's point is to give humanity wisdom and an oracle without penance, not so they have to turn to you to just uplift yourself. Satan replies and says, Sharply thou hast insisted on rebuke and urged me hard with doings which not will. Which is a way of saying, wow, you raised some very good points. Anyway, he goes on to say, so while you're, you know, down here on earth in the wilderness, can you entertain me for a little bit? Do you mind if I just kind of follow you around and see what this son of God is? Because if you are supposed to be the son of God, I should know what to reverence and what to respect. And he compares himself to a hypocrite in church. He says, if God allows a hypocrite to stand in a church and not be destroyed, perhaps you might allow this sinner to be in your presence. And Jesus replies and says, the very fact that you're able to stand here right now means God has allowed you here for a reason. So if this is my trial to put up with you, then sure, you can follow me around. So Satan's like, okay, cool. I'm going to uh, quickly go away for a little bit for no reason, and I'll be back. So it says that he disappears into the invisible all at once. The reason he's doing that is because he's now going back to the demons of hell to re-strategize so that when he shows up to Jesus later, he has a new game plan. After this, we see Andrew and Simon, two of Jesus's early disciples, who are back with John the Baptist, worried if something has happened to him. It's funny here because the early disciples are effectively used as a sort of Greek choir, because in a lot of traditional Greek plays, there's a choir who either recaps or commentates on the events of the story. So here, as the disciples are sitting around, they talk amongst themselves and say, perhaps whatever Jesus is doing, it's of some greater importance, and if the Spirit is guiding him, it must be big. We then see Mary, who is musing over the divinity and purpose of her child, because just as much as he's her son, he's God's child as well. We then see Satan return to his followers, and after he joins them once again up in the air, he explains that the whole turning rocks to bread thing didn't work. As a matter of fact, he's unsure if temptation will work at all and needs a new idea. While the devil is thinking, Belial, one of the demons mentioned in Paradise Lost, pops up and says that they should tempt Jesus with women. Now, as far as demonology goes, Belial is interesting. The word Belial is mentioned a few times in the Old Testament in reference to other people who are doing wicked things. The most famous example of this is the wicked sons of Eli, who are described as sons of Belial. Now, the word Belial is most often believed to mean either of wickedness or of corruption or of evil. So whenever it says sons of Belial, most interpretations take that to mean that they were of wickedness or just bad people. Like if today I said someone was the son of evil, I'm not saying they're the literal child of something named evil, just that they're of evil things. Well, in some sections of the Dead Sea Scroll, which were discovered in the last century, there is a demon named Belial who is described as the master of wickedness. This would explain why a lot of early traditions said that there was a demon named Belial. As a matter of fact, Belial is one of the 72 demons mentioned in the Lesser Key of Solomon. Through occult tradition, Belial has kind of been described as a sort of demon of lust, or at least of temptation, because Eli's sons that I mentioned earlier, and a lot of other times in the Old Testament that sons of Belial are mentioned, 
it is people who are enacting uh, sexual crimes of some kind. So it's believed that Belial is a sort of agent of lust, at least, again, in a lot of occult tradition. So to see here that this folklore demon, known as Belial, is depicted in John Milton's story as the one poking the devil and telling the devil to send women to tempt Jesus, is a very cool reference for nerds like myself. Belial continues and says that, after all, it worked on King Solomon. And King Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived, so, of course, sending women to Jesus is their best move. King Solomon, or the son of King David in the Old Testament, was, again, described as the wisest man who ever lived, and followed God righteously up until he began to fall in love with women from far-off lands who converted him over to their false gods. So Belial saying, if the wisest man who ever lived was corrupted by women, let's try that on Jesus. And Satan's response to Belial is the funniest part in the story. He says, Belial, in much uneven scale thou weighest all others by thyself. Because of old thou thyself dotst of womankind, admiring their shape, their color, and attractive grace, none are, thou thinkest, but taken with such toys. Before the flood, thou with thy lusty crew, false-titled sons of God, roaming the earth, cast wanton eye on the daughters of men, and coupled with them, and begat a race. In other words, the devil says, Belial, you always suggest women. Of course you always suggest women. Not everyone gets as distracted by women as you do, so stop bringing it up. That mention about coupling with mankind is in reference to the book of Genesis, where it says the sons of God and the daughters of men joined together and created a race of giants, which if you've seen my conspiracy iceberg, you know how I feel about all that. So the devil is saying you need to quit bringing up women. You're always obsessed with women. That's all you think about. The last time that I let you do your whole thing with women, we got giants all over the planet and there had to be a whole flood for that. So stop. The devil continues and says, of course women worked on Solomon because Solomon was born into a kingdom. Anything he could want, he was born with. He already had it. So the thing that is going to lead him astray is things of pleasure because that's all he's ever known. But Jesus is a being of wisdom and enlightenment and he's here for a purpose and trying to distract him with pretty girls isn't going to cut it. This gives Satan an idea. Jesus is a being of righteousness, and surely he must be a powerful creature who is worthy of praise. So, rather than trying to tempt him with things he's not interested in, like women, we should try to tempt him with something like honor and glory, and a way to prove himself in what we believe he wants to be known as. Which again, harkens back to the original temptation of Lucifer and also even the garden, of trying to exalt yourself above others. So even though the devil already pretty much tried this with the whole turn the rocks into bread thing, he's going to try it again, only more direct. I should also mention the reason that he's trying to get at Jesus and God through these temptations isn't because if Jesus performed a miracle, that would be wrong. He performed several miracles on earth, and it's not like turning rocks to bread would be a downfall at least not in the act itself. What the devil is trying to do is trying to get Jesus to lift his spirit up above humanity. He is trying to make Jesus realize that humanity is pathetic and not worth his time. So if he just decides to do his miracles now and decide to take his rule of the throne now, then he can go ahead and skip to the fun part. This is all to throw off the bruise of the serpent's head that was prophesied back in Paradise Lost because the devil believes if he can get Jesus distracted on something else, something that Jesus is supposed to be, then he can diminish God's plans and hopefully not lose. And of course, he himself maintain his power over earth. We then go back to Jesus, who is still in the wilderness. He's very hungry, but enduring. And during his hunger, he thinks of Elijah and Daniel, and how he is now suffering the same turmoil that they suffered in his name. There's also little lines of poetry that I like a lot in the story. Like, for example, as Jesus is walking, he walks onto a hilltop, and there's a whole section describing the scenery. And then it says, that opened in the midst a woody scene. Nature's own work, it seemed. Nature taught art. Just little notes like that, like beauty as we know it and art itself originates from nature in some way. And just the concept of nature teaching art what beauty is. It's, it's cool. I like it. 
So as Jesus is walking, suddenly a very rich and opulent looking man appears in front of him. Now, whenever it describes this guy's appearance, it's straightforward and just says that this is Satan. Earlier, whenever it was talking about the old man, uh, it said at the end, it's like it was revealed that it was Satan. But from the beginning here, he's just called the tempter. So at least to us, the Milton is saying that, yes, this is Satan. He's appearing as like a rich, opulent ruler. Um, but he doesn't explicitly say that to Jesus. Uh, and Jesus immediately knows, like he looks at him and perceives him and calls him the tempter and all that. Uh, but it's kind, it, to me at least, it was kind of implied that the devil was trying to make a disguise and it didn't work, <laughs> which would mean I choose to believe that's what happened because it's funnier. Because that would mean the devil appeared as an old man and was like, oh, Sonny, why don't you turn these rocks to bread? And then Jesus was like, I know you're the devil. So he transforms into the devil and is like, I'm so sorry about that. Can I hang out with you a while? And Jesus says, yes. So the devil's like, great, I'll be right back. And he disappears. And then <laughs> a rich man walks out of the brush like, well, howdy ho, sir. Have you thought about being God? today? I don't know if that's what it's implying, but like I said, I choose to believe that. The devil says that Jesus shouldn't have to suffer out here because this is the same land that the Israelites needed manna if they were to eat anything. So Jesus should feel no shame in getting hungry now because it took a miracle to feed the Israelites all the way back then. Jesus says that he doesn't need anything. And even if he did, he's not going to take something from someone with an ulterior motive. And the devil continues and says, well, all nature is yours when you think about it. Like this entire world was your creation. So you've never taken anything. People are just holding stuff that is yours. So you could have whatever you want and there's no stealing associated with it. As he says this, he tells Jesus to look and in the middle of the forest, a giant buffet appears. It's mentioned that on the buffet are fruits as sweet as the fruit from the tree of knowledge and that every manner of meat and pastry and dessert is laid across this table and all around the table are servers with every drink you could imagine. It says that the men are resolute as soldiers and that the women are as beautiful as the women that the Knights of King Arthur would imagine in the woods. The devil continues and says that nothing here is outside of the Jewish tradition. And if you were to eat all of this, you would be doing no wrong. You're a hungry man who came across food. And if you're to eat things that are within the law, then what's wrong with that? As a matter of fact, he doubles down and says that Jesus should set an example. Because what? Does he want his followers to get the idea that they're to turn away free food when there's nothing wrong with it? <laughs> Jesus responds and effectively says, I could have done that. Again, my purpose out here is to endure the plight of man and to show that I am worthy of the throne that I will one day take. If I want the angels to come and materialize any food I could imagine, I could have done that. That's not the point. Satan says that he understands that Jesus' purposes are beyond just food or pleasing the flesh. So with the snap of his fingers, it says with the noise of wings and talons, everything disappears. Which is a cool idea that all at once demons appeared with the blink of an eye and only the sound of them could be heard as they took everything away. The devil continues to try to boost God's ego and says that of course Jesus is greater than appetite. He's the son of God after all. He has to be great and he has to be a king worthy of praise. But he continues to talk and says but how could he be great without fame? You could be the best ruler in the world, but if you don't have anything to rule, no one will know of you. So he continues and says, if you want your magnificent influence to rule over the world, then we need to get you some money and a whole lot of soldiers and chariots and other things kings have. Christ responds and says that this is in no way what a king is supposed to be, that it is greater to be a king of your own spirit than a king of your own country. That things like wealth and riches, while not inherently evil, if someone chases after them to better themselves or better their position, all that they're doing is seeking vain glory. Furthermore, that there's a nobility in poverty, that by existing happily and contently in spite of not having material gains, you're proving your spirit truly worthy of something to be praised. Jesus continues and said that whenever God was told by the devil, which is funny because the way Jesus phrases it is he's just like, hey, remember when you did this? <laughs> Jesus says that whenever God was asked by the devil who his most righteous man was, God didn't say 
a king or some ruler of a giant empire, he said, hast thou considered my servant Job? Job, a man who was wealthy because of God's blessings, but he wasn't a king. God looked on the spirit rather than what he had. Also, a little bit of Milton's um, preferences shine through here because after Jesus brings up Job, uh, Jesus just starts talking about Socrates because if you'll remember, Milton really liked, you know, Greek uh, mythology and plays and uh, all the philosophers. So Jesus just spends a lot of lines like, and think of Socrates. That guy was incredible. Like he was poor. He was sad and, you know, re real sad he died and all. Uh, but that Socrates guy, yeah, he, he was cool. <laughs> and it's just funny to imagine that out of everyone in human history, Jesus would be like, Kaya, yeah, Socrates. <laughs> Satan counters this and says, well, while that's true, you are a pure and righteous soul. And if you rule over people, that will undoubtedly be a good thing. I mean, you want good things to happen to others, right? You're here to spread love and prosperity. So why wouldn't you want to be on the throne where you can just do that more effectively? He continues and says that Jesus could take down the Roman Empire. Then his people really would be free. Then he said the prophets would have joy in the afterlife knowing that their prophecy meant something. And in a sense, Jesus is being kind of selfish if he doesn't take the throne right now. Jesus says that this is all in due time, that he's not here to disrupt humanity's choices, but to aid them. He says now his time on earth is to be the servant, so that once again, he will one day be worthy of being the king. And then Jesus continues and says, by the way, if I step my way up to the throne, wouldn't that destroy you? Because Jesus knows that the devil knows the entire purpose of Jesus coming to earth is to bruise the serpent's head, right? To conquer death, hell, and the grave forever. So Jesus is like, why are you trying to hype me up to get on the throne knowing that that defeats your entire purpose? So Satan just turns on the victim routine. He's like, oh, well, I have had to be cast out of heaven and I am constantly in misery and woe and I just want to get it over with. Um, so I, I don't want to exist anymore. So the sooner that you take the throne, the sooner I can die. And I'm really looking forward to it. He continues and says, why wait? Everything will be better as soon as I'm gone and you're in charge. The devil continues and says, besides, you were born in Bethlehem and you've lived in Nazareth your entire life up until this point. You haven't even seen the empires and glories of the world. So let me show you. The devil takes Jesus to a mountaintop, and from there, they survey the kingdoms of the world. They can see all the mighty empires of Greece and Rome to China and India, and all the stages of the world that Jesus could have rule over. The devil keeps speaking and says, you know, prophecy is really nothing without action. So far, everything that the prophets have foretold means nothing. You're supposed to be the ruler of the world, right? And so far, you've shown no signs of that. On top of that, he says, even if you rule with peace and try to be this perfect benefactor to everyone you come across, how long do you think that's going to last? Do you think that the Romans are going to be okay with that? Do you think that whenever the empires of the East make their way over here, that they're just going to listen to what you have to say? The devil says, as a matter of fact, if I was you, I would start conquering right now. I would start with the Parthians. I would take all that they have, take their armies, and from there you can attack Rome. Again, the devil is thinking of this like a military conquest. The devil finishes this diatribe by saying, if you want that throne of David that you were prophesied to take, then I can help you take it. Jesus begins his response by saying, thou neither dost persuade me to seek wealth for empire's sake, nor empire to effect for glory's sake. By all thy argument, for what is glory but the blaze of fame? Jesus replies and says that when my time comes, it won't be like this. It won't be a conquest or a bloodshed. It will be a beneficial rule and reign over all the earth. No destruction of kingdoms, no torment. It will be peace, something that clearly the devil doesn't understand. This is when Jesus starts throwing in slight jabs at the devil himself, saying things like, the devil would know these things if he was still at the sight of God, but now his sight is so diminished from his lack of glory that he can't see the truth. The devil snaps back and says, don't think so little of fame or glory because this God of yours, your father in heaven, 
All he wants is glory. His entire purpose is for the world to worship him and for all of us to love and praise him so much. So for someone who thinks that glory isn't that important, you should probably talk to the Father. Jesus says, And reason, since his word all things produced, though chiefly not for glory as prime end, but to show forth his goodness and impart his good communicable to every soul freely, of whom what could he less expect than glory and benediction, that is, thanks, the slightest, easiest, readiest recompense. From them, who could return him nothing else? And not returning that would likeliest render contempt, instead, dishonor, obliquy. In other words, God made everything. The very fact that life exists at all is because of him. So whenever he wants people to come to him to have happiness and to have love, he's just trying to share more of his soul. People following him isn't for his own glory. I mean, he created the world. He doesn't need that. It's instead so that love that he created them with can be pure and focused, like it was always supposed to be. Before, again, the guy standing in front of him messed that whole thing up. Jesus continues and says, And as a matter of fact, for someone who keeps bringing up the throne of David and the lineage of Israel, didn't hear any of that whenever you were trying to kill them for hundreds and thousands of years. As a matter of fact, he says, remember all those times you tried to murder David outright and kept possessing people throughout Israel and knocked out thousands of them at a time and made them worship false gods? Where was that concern for the throne of Israel then? Why does it only matter now that you want me to take it for some reason? And right after Jesus says all that, it says, Perplexed and troubled at his bad success, the tempter stood, nor had what to reply. Discovered in his fraud, thrown from his hope so oft, and the persuasive rhetoric that sleeked his tongue and won so much on Eve, so little here, nay lost. But Eve was Eve, this far his overmatch, who, self-deceived and rash, beforehand had no better weighed the strength he was to cope with or his own. In other words, the devil was taken back. This worked on Eve, but Eve was a human, and he's standing before the Son of God now. Whenever the devil does speak, it says that he returns like a fly returns to food after it's been swatted away. So the devil, having no real response for this, just says, Hey, have we looked at Rome yet? You should look at Rome. Let's go to the other side of the mountain and take a look at that. Satan continues talking and says that the king of Rome has fallen into temptation and that he's lusty and full of pride and he's a horrible leader to rule this world. So perhaps rather than conquering, Jesus could simply take his throne. He would have dominion over effectively the whole world, at least the largest empire, and he could be a just ruler rather than the ruler who sits on the throne now. <laughs> and Jesus says, oh, he was tempted? Where do you think he got that from? While talking to the devil, Jesus says, then proceedest to talk of the emperor, how easily subdued, how gloriously. I shall, thou sayest, expel a brutish monster? What if I withal expel a devil who first made him such? Let his tormentor, conscience, find him out. For him I was not sent, nor yet to free that people, victor once, now vile and base. Jesus is like, oh, you want me to kick out the emperor because he's a bad guy? How about I just kick you out? Did you ever think of that? Jesus says once again, my kingdom is beyond all of this. And you were supposed to be a part of that kingdom too, Lucifer, but you lost your chance. And clearly you're not repentive about it, so that's out the door. The devil responds and says, I'm not trying to offer you nothing. I'm offering you the entire world. As a matter of fact, forget Rome, forget... India and China and the lands of the Far East, forget all of it. I'll just give you the world. Satan says, I have power and dominion over the air because I've been granted it for a time, and it's my power to grant that to you. And the devil says, all you have to do is fall down and worship me, and the world, every empire, every kingdom, every piece of it can be yours. This is phrased in Luke 4 verse 6 when it says, And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whosoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. So the devil is saying he'll give him the world if Jesus says that Satan is God and bows down to him. And Jesus responds and says, I never like thy talk, thy offers less. Now both abhor, 
since thou hast dared to utter the abominable terms, impious condition. But I endure the time till which expired, thou hast permission on me. It is written, the first of all commandments, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and only him shalt serve. And darst thou, did the Son of God, propound to worship thee accursed? Now, more accursed, for this attempt, bolder than that of Eve. <laughs> Jesus is like, I, I have had it up to here with you. I have hated every minute of this. And I originally just hated you and your offers, but now I despise both of you. He says the only being of worship is the creator, God. And as a matter of fact, the devil only has possession over these things because he has granted them for a time by humanity's choices and God's power. And that to stand before the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and ask Jesus to worship Satan, as he said, what you're doing now is even bolder than what you did with Eve. You're a steward, not an owner, and you need to act like it. So Satan says, you're right. You are far beyond anything of kingdoms or wealth. I've been watching you since you were a child in the temple and the way that you spoke to the leaders and you always had this wisdom about you that far exceeded want for money or land or power. And I should have realized that. So what you want is to be a ruler over Greece. That's what I can get you. So if you look right over there and he starts to show him Greece and all of the, <laughs> all of the philosophers. And he's like, I see that you're on a conquest of power, not wealth. So let's get you famous like that Socrates you like so much, huh? Jesus says, while they have done great things, it's still nothing compared to the existence with God. While they've done great things and are very smart people, it's nothing compared to the understanding of divinity, especially not the understanding that Jesus has. And again, Satan's missing the point. After Jesus finishes speaking, it says, So spake the Son of God, but Satan, now quite at a loss, for all his darts were spent, thus to our Savior with stern brow replied, Since neither wealth nor honor, arms nor arts, kingdom nor empire please thee, nor aught by me proposed in life contemplative or active, tended on by glory or fame, what dost thou in this world? The wilderness for thee is fittest placed. I found thee there, and thither will return thee. Yet remember what I foretell thee. Soon thou shalt have cause to wish thou never hast rejected, thus nicely or cautiously my offered aid. Effectively, the devil says, what? do you want? I am trying to give you empires, wisdom, riches, anything you want, and you have nothing to do with it. But you're supposed to come here as a king and as someone to rule and to reign. And I keep trying to give you avenues for that, but you're just not interested. The wilderness is the best place for you. No wonder you were running around in the woods because that's all you ever do. Satan uses a part of astrology. He says he looks to the stars and sees the future and that in the future, there's going to be a lot of suffering and turmoil in Jesus's life. And he's going to wish that in this moment, he had accepted the devil's offer. Again, it's like the devil can see parts of the future and parts of the plan, but he still doesn't get it. So the devil drops Jesus back into the wilderness and as night is beginning to set in, Jesus goes and begins to sleep on the ground underneath a sort of root system of a tree, trying to hide himself from the morning dew. As he tries to sleep, the devil decides that he is going to try to make Jesus' night miserable, so he fills his head with nightmares and visions, and causes a storm that it says causes even the mightiest trees to bow over, and lightning and thunder and rain pour down. The next morning, whenever Jesus gets up and begins walking, Satan comes to him and says that that storm last night was horrific and that this is only the beginning. Jesus is just now beginning his earthly ministry, and there's going to be a lot of physical and mental suffering. And that really, if Jesus wants to avoid it, he needs Satan. Or that, if nothing else, Jesus needs to take his throne quick. Or there's going to be a lot of hardships he could have missed out on. Jesus replies and says, Me worse than wet thou findest not. Other harm those tares which thou speakest of did me none. I never feared they could. Though noising loud and threatening nigh, what they can do as signs betokening or ill-boding, I contemn. As false portents, not sent from God, but thee, who, knowing I shall reign past thy preventing, obstrudest thy offered aid. That I, accepting, 
at least might seem to hold all power of thee. Ambitious spirit, and wouldst be thought my God, and stormest refused, thinking to terrify me to thy will. Desist, thou art discerned, and toilest in vain, nor me in vain molest. Jesus is saying, all I am is wet, and everything that happened to me last night was you. So why on earth would I want to make league with someone who is just trying to destroy me? Because I know what happens whenever I take the throne, and you know what happens. So we can stop playing this game where you try to build up vanity in me, and you cause all sorts of storms and bad things to happen because it's not going to work. And Satan's reply to that is one of my favorite parts of the entire story. To whom the fiend, now swollen with rage, replied, Then hear, O son of David, virgin born, for son of God to me is yet in doubt. Of the Messiah I have heard foretold by all the prophets of thy birth, at length announced by Gabriel, with the first I knew, and of the angelic song in Bethlehem field, on thy birth night that sung thee Savior born. From that time seldom have I ceased to eye thy infancy, thy childhood, and thy youth, thy manhood last, though yet in private bread, till at the fort of Jordan, whither all flock to the Baptist, I among the rest, though not to be baptized, by voice from heaven, heard thee pronounce the Son of God, beloved. The devil is furious. He's saying, I don't even think that you are the Son of God. And then he begins to say how he is obsessed over Jesus for every minute that Jesus has been on earth. He says that he was there the night that the shepherds told of Jesus coming into the world and that he has followed Jesus ever since. And that I, something about the way, I, I, I don't know if Milton was meaning to read as much into this as I am, but I'm, I'm going to do it anyway, where he says uh, the, the line about beloved. By voice from heaven heard thee pronounce the Son of God beloved. If you'll remember, Satan's original sin was the pride that he brought in because he wanted to take Jesus' place at the right hand of God. Everything that he has is jealousy. And this contempt that he's yelling at Jesus with is saying that Jesus doesn't deserve to be the Son of God. He's certainly not acting like it. Or in other words, he's certainly not acting how Lucifer would have. He continues and says, Thenceforth I thought thee worth my nearer view and narrower scrutiny, that I might learn in what degree or meaning thou art called the Son of God, which bears no single sense. The Son of God I also am, or was. Man, that, that or was carries some weight. I am, or was. And if I was, I am. Relation stands. All men are sons of God, yet thee I thought in some respect far higher so declared. Therefore I watch thy footsteps from that hour, and follow thee still on to this waste wild, where by all best conjectures I collect thou art to be my fatal enemy. He's just yelling at Jesus. He's saying, you're not worthy to be the son of God. I'm, I've spent years trying to discern what makes you special, what makes him look on you as his child in a way he didn't look on me. What, what holds me back from being in the position you were supposed to be? And man, that line, it's uh, where it says, the son of God, which bears no sense. The son of God, I also am or was. It's such a, it's, it's a tragic line. And, and I want to be careful here. I'm not saying that the devil, as he's portrayed in the story or real life, to my belief, is, you know, sympathetic in a, a, a sense, because, you know, uh, once again, let me emphasize the concept of bad and death and all that, his idea, he brought that in. Uh, so definitely not deserving of, I feel, any empathy or anything like that. However, it is tragic. It is misery that the, the devil, the morning star, who was described as one of the chiefest among the angels, fell to such depths. And now to imagine this conversation with Jesus, where the entire time he has kept up this haughty demeanor of, oh, well, perhaps I could help you with this, or perhaps you can do that. And now that none of his tricks have worked, he's just broken down and he's yelling, why are you beloved? Why do you get to be special? I've followed you your entire life up until this point, and I see nothing you have that I don't. What does it even mean to be the son of God? I was one of those. Humanity is one of those. What makes you so special? Why can't I be like you? To the utmost of mere man, both wise and good, not more for honors, riches, kingdoms, glory, have been before contempt, and may again. 
Therefore, to know what more thou art than man, worth naming the Son of God by voice from heaven, another method I must now begin. The devil's saying, I still have no idea why you're considered this special Son of God, so I guess I'm going to have to find out the hard way. He takes Jesus and flies him to the top of the temple in Jerusalem, and placing him on one of the pinnacles on top of the temple, he says, if you're so special, if you're this Son of God, then prove it to me. In the Old Testament, it says that no harm would come to the Son of God that wasn't meant to be, and that at any moment he could call down angels to save him from whatever danger befalls him. So if you're really the Son of God, why don't you jump off this temple I've set you on top of and tell the angels to come get you? This is a last-ditch effort to, at this point, just prove to the devil that Jesus has something he doesn't, that he has some power or reverence, or to at least see God's point of reverence in him. In Luke chapter 4, it says, And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus, thrown up here on top of the temple, the last ditch from Satan himself to see what he has of worth, to prove that Jesus could be pushed to the point of showing his hand, of doing what Lucifer would have done, of wanting to prove his power to his adversary and show how much better he is, trying to make Jesus give a final, if desperate, display of power. And all Jesus does is he looks at him and says, Also it is written, Tempt not the Lord thy God. And this, this was the defeat. This was all it took. Because, again, Lucifer's point was to prove to God or humanity or at least himself that Jesus is no better than him. That he will be pushed from the same pride that caused him to eventually tempt and cast humanity into darkness. From the same pride that besets him now and keeps him from allowing himself to forgive. The same pride we saw all the way back in the garden. And all of his temptations have been to try to get Jesus to fall into that same trap. So here he's made himself the villain. He's thrown Jesus on top of the temple and says, save yourself. Show me the angels. Show these angels I can't be a part of, that I used to be a part of. Show me a hint of your power. Because that's exactly what Lucifer would do. But all Jesus does is quote the scripture and says, I'm not going to tempt God. Because, again, that would be exactly what Lucifer would do. It says, with this, Satan falls, that he falls down towards the earth, truly defeated in spirit and body. And it says, as he falls, he falls as the griffin who asks the question in mythology and then casts itself into the deeps, that Satan here, knowing he's bested, throws himself from the air of the clouds. And that as he does, the demons join quickly to commune and take him back to the sky. And that as they talk, they talk of how this is the final defeat and how it truly seems that the serpent's head will be bruised, and that they are powerless to stop the true Son of God. At the same time, angels come and commune with Jesus. They carry him from on top of the temple, and it says they take him to a lavish field full of beautiful food as his trial has passed, and he has proven himself worthy to stand up against temptation and worthy to be the sacrifice for humanity. This is from the account of Matthew 4, verse 11, where it says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. The angels begin to sing, and in their song they say, Him long of old didst thou dispel, and down from heaven cast with all his army. Now thou hast avenged supplanted Adam, and by vanquishing temptation hast regained lost paradise, and frustrated the conquest fraudulent. A fair paradise is founded now for Adam and his chosen sons, whom thou a savior, are come down to reinstall, where they shall dwell secure when time shall be of tempter and temptation without fear. They're saying that now it's been proven to all witnesses Jesus is the Son of God and that now the mistake that was made at humanity's creation all the way back in the garden with Adam and Eve has now been undone. The lost paradise finally regained. They begin to sing of what he'll do in the future, that he will be so powerful that he will run demons out with just his voice, a reference to the story of Mark chapter 5 of the Maniac of Kader, and how he will do great things in the name of God, and that his name will be great forever, and that now it has been proven that humanity will be saved. And the story ends with the lines, Thus they, the Son of God, our Savior meek, 
sung victor, and, from heavenly feast refreshed, brought on his way with joy. He, unobserved, home to his mother's house, private returned. Just ending with the picture that, in spite of all of this, Jesus returned to Mary's house, and from there continued the ministry we see in the Gospels and the ministry that affects us to this day. And with that, we end the story of Paradise Regained. Paradise Regained is definitely not as large of a work as Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost is over 10,000 lines, I believe, and Paradise Regained is just over 2,000. So like a fifth of the length. Uh, and also the wording is much more direct than a lot of Paradise Lost. Uh, I know it may have not have sounded it because a lot of it's kind of like, you know, middle-ish English speak, but Paradise Lost used a ton of simile. There was a ton of metaphors made, representations between like old Greek stuff compared to the Garden of Eden, whereas most of Paradise Regained was a conversation. Um, and it, it's interesting how Paradise Lost was all these beautiful pictures and poems and we kept cutting back between heaven and hell and the garden, whereas here it's just a conversation between two people. Well, people. Um, but it, it's so interesting to me how Milton managed to take this story that otherwise is pretty short in the Bible and expand it into this overwhelming narrative. And I think he did it masterfully. And it's interesting to see how his ideas of theology relate to a lot of ideas that are still practiced and believed today. Um, and it's just, I, I believe a lot of wisdom taken from the words there. And I thought it was a fantastic story, and hopefully you did too. And I just want to say thank you for watching. Paradise Regained is a fascinating story. And if you couldn't tell, I'm a big fan. Uh, some of, I, I know I was probably reading too far into it at some points, but some of it, like with uh, whenever Satan is talking to Jesus and he's like, what, what makes you special? Why are you beloved? And that it killed me when I was reading it through the first time. And he says, I am a son of God or was. Man, that's good stuff. And I see stuff like that and I'm like, to, to be one of these ancient writers who, ancient, it was the 1600s, that's not ancient, uh, but to be one of these um, writers from times before and to not have, you know, access to the internet like we do, not able to read other people's opinions and interpretations and art and to just glean from the scripture and bring this out of it, it it's beautiful. Uh, and I, I also want to clarify I'm not saying that I believe the account of Milton to be like the true account or like, oh, this definitely happened in between, uh, but it's a beautiful way to look at it. And a lot of, a lot of the doctrine is interesting and I, I think it's cool, but I've gone on about it long enough. So thank you all so much for sticking around. Hopefully you enjoyed. And also uh, you want to come over here, sweetie pie. Uh, I, I <laughs> She's got the dog who is fighting her right now. A lot of you probably saw my community post and tweet. Can you sit down in here? Can you fit? We can. Uh, hello. <laughs> hi. So this is my girlfriend, Kayla, as a lot of you know, this but I'm our, here to announce. This is our son. And this is our son, Ollie. Uh, a lot of you may have not have seen the community post or tweet. Uh, so I want to announce that she is no longer my girlfriend, Kayla. She is now my fiance, Kayla. Uh, I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. I said and no. She said no, and I'm now holding her against her will. I'm there's, being held. there's a gun behind the couch you can't see. Um, but she <laughs> is next to God, the best thing to ever happen to me, and I am honored to be with her. She honored me by saying yes, and I'm thrilled. My life couldn't be better right now. Guys, if I die tomorrow, I just want you to know I had a great run. Every, <laughs> everything's been fantastic. I want for nothing. Uh, and it, anyway, just, I want, sorry, just, I'm very happy. Uh, <laughs> oh, he's not happy at all. He's super upset. Um, but I love this girl a lot. She agreed to marry me. So you all have a new mom now. Is what, well, she's always been your, uh, your mom. Uh, but now she, she's not your stepmom. She's just the mom who stepped up. This is up. your brother. This is your brother, Ollie. Uh, <laughs> He's so upset. He's got his ears pinned. <laughs> okay, yeah. I anyway, I just wanted to uh, announce that here, for those who don't know, uh, my soon-to-be wife, uh, you're all a legal mother now, I should say, and this guy. Anyway, just wanted to announce that. Um, and yeah, hopefully you enjoyed Paradise Regain. More videos coming soon. 
and that should be it. That should do it for now, but I just want to say thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed, and I will see you in the next one. Bye! Uh, this is Isaiah. Uh, this is not. Apologies. No problem. Bye. That was the FBI, probably. <laughs>